only episode of Abhyan series. Here we meet uh, inspiring people who are working on all kinds of social issues. We try to have an insight into the work that they do about the campaign and about what they believe in. Today we have with us um, amazing Erika Ma'am uh, from Animal Aid uh, Analytics, uh, sorry, yeah, NGO Foundation. And we are so grateful to have you here, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be with you today. Thank you. So and I'm so glad that you're interested in animal issues. Yeah, thank you. So I'll start now. Humans are one of the only few kinds of animals who are known to possess and care for other species. We all keep all manner of animals for various reasons. So, and we have many times seen along the roads an injured animal and we are helpless. We don't know how to help them. So, Eka ma'am and many other NGOs are such uh, doing an amazing job helping animals, not only dogs and cats, but many other animals. So, let's get started. So, the first question is, everyone, as I said, at one point of life have seen an injured dog, a cat, or any other animals for that sake. So, can you suggest what should one do individually who have no experience? Oh, okay, I love that question because it it happens to most of us and it happens to almost all of us when we consider that we might be seeing a species that we have no experience with. So you may have experience with a cat or a dog, but not with a bull yeah. or not with a fox that you see on the road or an injured bird. And it's uh, it's very difficult if you don't have a touching, a physical touching relationship with an animal that is mobile. In other words, it may be injured, but if it can move, it's gonna probably run away from you unless you have a real relationship already with it. So there are so many different situations that I can't begin to really generalize about it because it may be a large animal, small, and it may be injured to the point that you, your biggest seva might be moving it out of the road so that it doesn't get hit again by another car. You know, so I think I'm, I'm going to speak generally. It's not going to apply to all but a few situations, but I'll try to cover a few things. Um, so being in the road, recumbent, that means laying down and unable to stand, is a super dangerous situation for an animal, but it may also be a dangerous situation for you if you're going to try to move it out of the road. And there's tragic situations where people trying to do good have been themselves hit by cars. So it's not something to just jump out of your vehicle and run into the road to try to grab it. That will be your instinct. Don't do it. Pull over safely, look both ways. Even if the animal is writhing and in a terrible situation, don't just jump out in the road, watch for cars. If it's a dog and it's been hit, it may snap and it may try to bite you because when an animal is extremely stressed like that, traumatized, even a human, they might start punching. An animal might start nipping, a dog might start nipping. If he is, if he is in, in that kind of shock or she, it doesn't mean she's vicious, it means she's his, sort of hysterical. Might've been hit in the head, might've rolled and is really scared. So what you need to do if, is keep a blanket in your car and that way, if you come across a situation or put it in the boot, put it in your dickey of your of your scooter or, or your bike, because you will need that to gently cover the head of the animal. Once the eyes are closed and it's in the darkness, most animals calm down right away and they stop struggling. So that's really important. And that's that's you you can use that blanket uh, if you had to and rescue a donkey or even a cow. When they go into darkness, it makes them feel more secure. When, as long as we're talking about dogs, one of the most important things you can do is make friends with the dogs in your neighborhood or colony. Carry parleges with you, take a little tiny bit of a parlege or a bag of pedigree, vegetarian pedigree, and just feed a kibble or a little bit of a nibble every time you pass one of your neighborhood dogs. And gradually within days, you'll be able to start to touch their head and move their fur in the direction of the back of their head, on their face. That's where they're most comfortable. You might think their tail would be their most comfortable or their toes, but that's their least comfortable. They are most confident on their face. And the reason it's important to start that touching relationship is so that if they meet a problem, 
And even if that problem is that problem is quite minor, a little wound, a little wound from a little fight, little scuffle that they got in from somebody else, it's so important that you have a touching relationship so you can hold her just long enough to, to put a little bit of antibacterial cream on it or fly cream uh, on it. So, so that maggots, which are the little eggs that flies lay, don't get into that wound because they can make it much, much worse. Um, so touching or any problem, let's say the dog has a fracture. Maybe it's your, maybe it's a dog that you, if it's in your neighborhood, even if you've been touching that dog, she might let you pick her up and take her to the vet. And that's what your goal is. If, if you're lucky enough to have an NGO like Animal Aid Unlimited in your neighborhood, then you can call somebody for help. But there are probably only about 20 such shelters in, that are big enough to just have a vehicle and come out and, and, and really help you. In, in mostly in the bigger metro cities, there are individual activists and there are individual smaller groups that also may be able to help. And I'll give you some a link uh, to the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations because they have a roster that has individuals and smaller groups that are theoretically available to help in an animal emergency. And sometimes that is such a godsend, even if they don't know a lot more than you do, just having a buddy there to hold the animal while a friend comes with a lorry or you know, if let's say it's a bigger animal and you have to rent a vehicle to move it or, or, or they can help you round up six people to try to move that cow out of the street or whatever the situation is. Also to protect yourself, so you've got a blanket in your car. I want you to have a scissors in your car and I'll explain why. And I want you to find a vet in your local area that you know where he or she is and you know that they have said in principle, they will help you with an unowned animal. They may charge you for it, but that, that they're available and you understand how to contact them. Because many of the cases you really will need a vet. An example, and I'm, I'm go, I can talk a long time about many things. So Manasa, just redirect me if you want me to get to other things. But um, a head injury, a rabies virus, a neurological condition, another kind of virus like canine distemper, all can look similar to each other. It is very hard to diagnose a dog that's acting weird. It might have, been, it might have had a head injury. It might have had a, a, brain, de a brain injury. It might, be, it might be dangerous because it is suffering so much from rabies and, or it just might be confused and going around in circles because it's, it's been knocked on the head. And so it's very important to go to, to take that dog to a vet. Um, and not try to diagnose it yourself. If you're in an area though where there really is not a vet, and that's the worst situation where you don't know who to turn to or anything, you just are absolutely out of ideas. One safe thing to do if you can move that animal is to get, if it's a dog or a cat, to get it into an enclosed space, keep the lights low, Dar darkness is preferred, and if you can help them be quiet, make sure they have water, let them sleep. Sometimes quite serious head injuries or other injuries, they seem quite serious, but what the animal needs to do is just be quiet for 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours, and, and they, they rest and they start to regenerate. Doesn't happen all the time, but that's only what to do if you have no other option and you don't know what to do. So you want to, and, and, and just like with a human, you would want to stop bleeding if you could, but you never want to tie a tourniquet or put on a bandage of an animal that is not confined by you. Because if it gets away from you, you will not be able to catch it again. And that bandage can kill them. The injury might've healed, the wound might've healed, but you put a bandage on it and you can't take the bandage off for days and days, it will get, the tissue will get will die, get necrotic, it will get so infected underneath that bandage. So well-meaning people sometimes will put a bandage on, they think that they will meet the animal in a few days to take it off, but they don't meet the animal. So, and that's 
that can be a death sentence because it, it may not, that bandage may not come off by itself. So please never do that. If you are not in a position to confine the animal in your house or in some kind of shed, some place where it can't get away, don't bandage it. Um, so th that's a basic, the reason I say to put a scissors vehicle or a knife is that if you see donkeys whose feet are tied together, you need to, you need to cut that because that always, always costs them the use of their leg in time and not, not in great time. Some happens within a few days. The people that do it are, are extremely ignorant or they don't care. It's not, it may be cheaper for them to throw the donkey away. And they, they've done it because they don't want the donkey to run away, but the donkey can get away. It just cuts through their tendons and you'll see it often. Always cut that, cut that. It's, it doesn't matter whether they've done it up at the, on the thigh or at the ankle. You need to cut it because it will go cut through the, as they pull each leg, it, it slowly starts to cut through the skin, then the muscle, then the tendon. And we've had donkeys come in whose foot has actually come off from the pressure friction. Put off, like it's, it's so bad. And a lot of times what the owners do is they tie, they tie with whatever piece of stuff that they can find. So it's, it's not a, um, even rope is extremely dangerous, but they'll tie with a packing tape that's like the type that goes over your suitcase and it just cuts like a knife. So please keep that scissors and knife and you'll be surprised how often you can use it. And, and we're, we're trying, if we can do that and we can, we can really, um, discourage the owners, you, you know, you can talk, if the owners are there, you can try to talk them out of it, but they're not going to listen. They may cut it off while you're there, but they will retie it probably as soon as your back is turned, as soon as you've gone somewhere else. So, so that's, a, that's a really lovely thing to have with you. Another thing to put in your vehicle, if you really want to become kind of an animal person that's watching, keep a bowl so that you can put some water in a bowl. Thirst when you've had, when you've been hit by a car, and this is true for a human, your blood pressure drops. You need water. You can get dehydrated very quickly. And many deaths in children, in, in adult humans, and in animals actually happen from being thirsty. So you need to hydrate them as one of the top priorities. And if you take, if you take a, an injured animal to the vet, a good vet will start giving them a an IV, an intravenous drip right away. And they'll do that for you too if you go to the hospital. Uh, they know now, med medical you know, science knows now that you, you, you have to, I'm not a vet by the way, and I don't know very much about medicine, but I know these tips. Um, so the hydration helps balance all your body, you know, your body chemistry that has been thrown out of whack from the shock of the accident. So you know, it may be thrown out of whack also by blood loss increased elevated heart rate, breathing deeply. All those things are spending water energy. And if you, once you get dehydrated, all sorts of things go, go bad. So keep a water dish in there and keep a little bit of pedigree in there because you might need to lure or keep parlegies with you. You might need to lure, you'll notice in the animal aid videos, we have rescue videos on YouTube. We have a couple hundred of them and they're fun and easy, interesting to watch because, um, you always are guaranteed of a happy ending, though the beginnings are often upset, you know, they're upsetting because the animal has become injured or ill and they're in bad shape. All animals are not in bad shape in our rescues, but the ones we post on YouTube usually are. So, uh, and, and the ones we post on YouTube always got better. So you, you, you don't be afraid to watch. Um, and Parlegies, are, will distract an animal long enough to that you can actually catch it. And if you watch a few of those videos, like 10 of them, you might even see things that you want to copy. If you're lucky enough to have a vet, you can take the animal to. And I don't want you to get bit though. And that takes a lot of practice. So another thing I want to mention is that if you're interested in helping animals, please volunteer if there's any kind of a shelter or sanctuary in your area. And during COVID times, that hasn't been possible, but COVID's going to be behind us someday, someday soon. 
and you can come to animal aid, for example, spend a week, your, your knowledge and comfort with animal behavior of all species, donkeys, bulls, goats, pigs, cats, dogs, you're going to increase your knowledge base while having a blast, having the best time of your life. And when we have volunteers at Animal Aid, we really try to help create situations where they're one-on-one -on -one interacting with animals and are able to experience different species at different times of the day. So that, and we don't just, sometimes, you know, I've heard of shelters where the volunteers are only allowed to clean and stuff. And that's not how we, you may, there may be a little bit of cleaning sometimes, but the, our, our reason for wanting people to come volunteer, it's great for the animals, love it. They love the stimulation and play and, and comfort and cuddling. But for you, the volunteer, it's a life-changing experience because never in one's life, mine included, do you get such a range of personalities and such a range of different situations. We have many dogs in sanctuary who can't use their hind legs. So they're going on their front legs because they've had a spine injury. And so that you can't have a wheelchair all the time for a dog, or you can't have a prosthetic um, leg all the time because it, it's almost impossible to fit on an animal. So the solution for these, and they're very happy, but we have them on a sandy ground and most of them are quite mobile. They get around well. But they don't even know that they can't use their hind legs. They're not aware of that in a way, but we have um, a hydration pool that's really fun to take them in and they can swim well because Dogs swim with their front feet, not with their hind feet. And so they don't know the difference. They're great swimmers and they love the water. And there's so many things, brushing, bathing, just playing with dogs and brushing donkeys and cows and just feeding baby calves that have been orphaned. So satisfying and interesting for you. And that's what we want. We want your, we want your, understanding of yourself with animals to grow so that you seek them out and you recognize and learn more and more that you have the power to save their life you have the power to make their day happier you have the you gather getting the insight that let's say your neighbor has a pet german shepherd that they've bought they didn't really have the situation where they could keep a dog happy and they've got the dog in the house all the time changed to the motorcycle up on the roof in the hot sun the dog is a nuisance to them mom doesn't want to clean up dog poop they don't have they have a servant that walks the dog for 10 minutes twice a day and otherwise the dog is sleeping or snappish and the reason it's snappish is because it's starting to lose its mind and there are many dogs in many houses that are starting to lose their mind and they're so bored dogs need to use their intelligence. They need to make decisions. They need to have relationships. They need fresh air. They need to not be on a chain all the time. They need to be able to sniff whatever they want to sniff, meet who they want to meet. They're so clever. And we, Manasa, we have turned so many of them into couch potatoes. We get a dog. We don't really want to do much with them. They're, they're watching television all the time. They're sitting, they're sitting, they're sleeping. And we're thinking, wow, my dog sleeps for 20 hours a day. It's because he's not okay. They, he shouldn't sleep for 20. The dogs sleep a lot, but not like that. And, and that means that you're doing something very wrong to the, to the dog. So if you feel your dog is depressed, it is depressed. If you only have one dog, get another one, get a second one. Um, if you... Are, do not have a garden and for, because you paid for your dog, which I hope you never do again, but if you have bought a dog from a breeder, a commercial breeder, reason that's so sad is because there's thousands of fantastic deshi dogs waiting for a home. But if you made that mistake, you still need to let them go out with the other dogs. They are a dog. There's nothing special. I know many people that have the misconception that an English breed dog is almost a different species and can't handle the neighborhood dogs. 
yes, she can handle them and she needs to, you need to get her spayed or neutered and you need to let her get out there and, and make her way with the others. And she'll come back in the evening, but don't, don't try to control your dog all the time because that's, that's death to the dog's mind. Similarly, your grandmother has a cow tied up. You think that it's great relationship. Granny loves the cow. If that cow is content to be on the chain all the time, that's because she has been extremely broken in her mind. Cows don't want to be tied all the time. They, they also are intelligent, curious, they, and opinionated. They also need to be off that chain and able to make their own decisions. And it's very difficult if somebody has a cow in an urban center and all there is is garbage to eat on the side of the road. There's differences of opinions among animal protectors about which is a worse fate, to wander in the traffic eating garbage or to be tied up behind the house. Personally, I think, this is my, just my opinion, I would rather let it go out and eat the garbage and even be risk being hit by a car because being confined all the time is a slow torture. It's like being in you know, solitary confinement Human beings have about two weeks of sanity in solitary. They can't handle it and neither can animals. So if they look calm and peaceful, it's because they are super depressed. An animal should only be confined like that for a couple of hours a day. Rest of the time they need to be free. So I think one of my best points to make to you all is don't get an animal don't own an animal is number one. Take care of the animals in your area, but don't try to quote unquote own an animal. They are not ours to own. They're in, in a sense, they, they need their freedom and we can give them so much love and so much support without confining them and controlling them. And it's a, it's a uh, you know, I, I, on the other hand, in some ways, Pet adoption is also a, a great thing to do or pet fostering. I, so I shouldn't say, you know, I have to be careful what I say because it's, it, so many things are paradoxical. In other words, there's two good, there's two good paths and there can be multiple, multiple good paths and multiple bad ones. But um, what I really mean to say is if you don't have a situation where you can give a, an animal a better life than they would have on the street, please don't take one. And a, and a street life, if a dog is spayed and neutered, if you can, because if you can touch and hold that dog, you can take it to the vet to have it spayed or neutered. Its puppies will die if you don't do that. Almost everyone dies. In a litter of six of a street dog, 90% of the time, the mother also dies. When the puppies get about two and a half months and they start to need more food, she sacrifices her life trying to nurse them. They need more than what she has. There's not enough street food for six times six times six times six that every time twice in a year, they're getting pregnant and creating six more mouths to feed. It's a logarithmic increase. I can't even do the math, but it becomes thousands within a couple of weeks. So if you're feeding dogs, it's so important to get them sterilized because if you're feeding them, you're creating a stronger breeding machine, but you don't have enough, I guarantee you, you don't have enough hours in the day, money in your pocket and fingers on your hands to feed more than a year. You'll be out of control in a year because each of those six females will have six babies herself within one year. So it's an impossible, and you'll break your heart it'll kill you to see it because you'll already love the mom and you'll already love several of the puppies and then you'll watch them die and you won't be able to stop it. So please, if you feed a dog, get her sterilized. If you feed a dog, touch her. And that when, and more important, if you, if you can't get all of the dogs, just do the females. The logic behind that is that a male dog can impregnate any number of female dogs. And so you'd have to, the logic would be you'd have to neuter all the males to keep all the females from getting pregnant. One of them can get six females pregnant. So you need to get 
the females. That is your priority. And be sure to do it if you're feeding them. Manasa, I'll let you ask me another question. I'm just, I can go off on so many tangents. But it's really informative, actually. I have learned a lot of new information. So I, I really do like uh, you know, hearing you speak. So anyways, I, I'll go to the next question. It's connected, actually. So uh, when you're saying like you can feed uh, like dogs, biscuits, uh, if they don't want to make them comfortable with you. But I have heard that they are not healthy for you in the long run. So people who regularly go and feed the street dogs, like do you have any healthy alternatives for them? Yes, yes, and it's, so it's true. If you're doing regular feeding, don't give biscuits, biscuits, biscuits. That's not nutritional food. Nor is rotis and milk. Milk is not necessarily good for dogs. Uh, milk is good for baby animals in the same species of the milk. So you don't drink cat's milk. You don't drink dog's milk. We don't drink milk at all. Many people are lactose intolerant. It's not really nature's way to drink the animals, uh, another animal's milk. And for dogs, many of them, just like humans, have allergies and it causes stomach problems. So the diet we recommend is soybeans that have been soaked overnight, cooked and mashed, and use about half soybeans and half rice. And you can get a very cheap rice. You don't have to, or you can mix it with rotis. Um, and then you can also do half rice and, or, sorry, half soybeans. They have high protein. We This is a researched diet. This is not just an invention. This is a medically researched, peer-reviewed, published vegan diet for dogs. That's very, very healthy for them. Adequate protein, adequate. You want to add to that a liquid vitamin supplement. If you've got, let's say you're feeding eight dogs in your neighborhood, make a batch of soya beans, take last night's doll, mix it up, whatever's left over, put some rice in it, put the amount of liquid vitamins that is recommended on the, as the amount on the bottle. I don't know what you'll, what you'll be using. And you don't have to do that every day, but every few days, put some vitamins in there. If you have vegetables left over from dinner last night, throw them in. But your dogs will start to like this. It's surprising. At first, they might turn up their nose, but they won't do that long. It's tasty. And you can put a little bit of salt and a little haldi for taste. Um, there's a lot of natural oil in soybeans, so you don't need to add cooking oil to it. And it's a little bit sloppy and heavy to carry. That's the only thing. That, the alternative is to get vegetarian pedigree. That is, pedigree is the brand name. It's expensive though. So I think the soya bean is a, is a less expensive option if you're feeding 10 dogs um, or five dogs. But if you don't want the fuss and bother of that, then vegetarian pedigree, please don't feed meat. Please, even though animals, well, dogs and cats, Cats are another story, but dogs are what they're called, what's called omnivorous, like humans. They can get a healthy diet from many different plant sources too. And they even, some of them really like carrots and, you know, gully potatoes. So um, we love the idea of not taking the life of one animal to feed another. That's a really nice feeling to not be doing that. And it's a sad feeling if you are stuck in a habit of doing it. And that's why cats are a very complex problem because cats do need animal protein in their diet. So if you're keeping cats, you really don't have any choice but to feed commercially processed food that is using animal byproducts usually from the food industry where they've killed the animals for the, for the meat that humans are consuming. Many people don't realize that in India, India is the highest meat exporter in the world. So even though there is a wonderfully big vegetarian community in India, the problem is, is that the dairy industry is so big and the dairy industry creates 50% of the babies that have to be born every year in order for the mom to keep the mother cow, to keep on producing milk, she has to be pregnant every year. And the problem is that half of her babies are boys. And nowadays, 
maybe used to in the past, they would pull a plow or have work in a field in some way, pulling. But that's not done anymore, really very many places. Almost everywhere you look now, a tractor is pulling a plow. So it's impossible for a farmer, even a, even a farmer that loves animals. I don't wanna make a person sound like a villain. They're not, but they can't afford to keep the bull calves. It's very expensive to feed cows, very expensive and bulls. So you'll see occasionally bulls on the street in the, where you live. But if you count the number of bulls compared to the number of cows, you'll find that it's you know one out of 50 or something because most of them are sold. And I'm sorry to say that they are sold for the, they're slaughtered and they're killed. And they're usually, that happens usually when they're quite young. And I'm pretty convinced, Manasa, that many of the people that sell their baby bull calves may not know, they don't want to know, but they, they are being told, they may be being told by the buyer that they are taking the, the baby bulls to be working in the fields in Madhya Pradesh or something. They, they may lie about it. But if you go to those places, you'll find that there aren't bulls pulling the plows. There's not, agriculture isn't done that way anymore. So they've taken them somewhere else. And, and that's a, a really good reason why you should, if you can't eliminate milk and ghee and dahi from your diet, try to do it. But at least cut it down as much as you can. Because for every cow that's producing milk for you, year after year, she's having a baby that's being separated from her in anguish and going to the loneliest, darkest place you can imagine. And that's why being a plant eater which I think all humans are super adapted for. We can eat anything, but it's so healthy and it's mentally healthy. I changed so much when I started to realize, and I was in my forties when I, I mean, I was a vegetarian earlier, but you know, and I really got my kind, now I'm 65, so I'm much older, but I, and I was so much older than you, Manasa, and from your colleagues in school. When I started to learn about what really is happening to the animals and the, in the food industry and in the leather industry, in those trades that, that use animals. And I, I really just didn't know. I can remember, and, and I guess the reason that I like saying I didn't know and I used a lot of products that I don't use now is that people can change. And I changed and I know so many people that you, and it's a constant process. It's not like if you're still drinking milk, or if you're even still occasionally eating fish or something, I'm not, I don't want to come off like I'm condemning you. I'm not at all. Because the trajectory of change is lifelong. And you can make, even if you, you know, when you make an improvement here or there, there's so much more we can do to reduce our carbon footprint and use less fossil fuels and pollute less, use less plastic bags. Just don't throw our garbage out, don't burn our garbage, bury it or take it to a take it to a tip. There's not so many options for what to do with garbage, but if you are if you are dumping your garbage on the side of the road, make sure that any food garbage is out of the plastic bag because the cows can't really get into the food without eating the plastic also. And pretty much every cow or bull that you see on the street is full of plastic because it doesn't they have three stomachs, it catches and it doesn't come out. And so most cows are carrying 20, 30 kilos of plastic and they die from it. They always die from it. So it, they can live for several years with this plastic building up. So like if you see a big bull who's kind of ribby, but he's looking, he's looking big in the stomach, it might be just plastic. And a lot of times you'll see a cow that's very ribby up here and then big belly and you think pregnant might be pregnant, but might, might just be plastic. And so what happens with the plastic is that they comes a day when they can't pass any of their, their no bowel movement and they die of bloat 
explode is when gas builds up from these plastic bags that they've eaten. And they've and and I see people are so they they just don't stop and think. So I see people all the time have beautiful green vegetables that they could just open the bag. Don't put the bag even near it. The bag has residual veggies in it. So don't put it there. Rinse it out. Rinse it thoroughly. If you've bought, you know, chaat masala or you've bought honey puri and you've taken it home, or not honey puri, but whatever, you've got something and it's coated the bag. Take the extra moment to rinse it out because otherwise a cow is going to eat it. That's for sure it will eat it. And, and tell your friends if they're not thinking like that, just take the food out of the bags. So I, I can't even remember your question, but I, I, answer, I answered a lot. It's okay, ma'am. Like, uh, I'm really thankful that you're giving me so much information because I personally, personally have learned a lot. So this is a kind of a personal question. Like, doesn't it overwhelm you, like, seeing all these things? Like, you know it shouldn't be done, but a lot of people are doing it. Like, so how do you cope up with it? I love that question because there are days or moments and days sometimes when I feel like I am really, really down. But I think what saves me is several things. One is that I'm lucky enough to be around animals that are healing all the time. So I, I'm seeing animals, animal aid takes in about 20 or 30 new patients every day. And we have 800 here at our hospital and I live just next door to the hospital, but at my, my gate is part of animal aid. So I'm lucky and I get to see recovering animals and it boosts me so much to see them feeling better. Not all of them survive, but many of them do. And to see them transform from misery to joy is a big fuel for me. The other thing though, is people like you, Manasa, give me hope that you're interested in these things is a big thing to me. And that your friends are, if, some, if anybody's watching or whoever is watching this and, and the people, I, I am changing and I see people changing and it seems to me the snowball is gathering snow. And, and if we can just keep pushing that snowball of consciousness, I know so many more people today than I knew even five or 10 years ago who are thinking about these animal, animals in research. You know, like saying, what cosmetics am I buying? Was these cosmetics tested on poor innocent animals that have been enslaved in these horrible research labs poison, 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 and then thrown out dead. For me to have lipstick, you know, like that's such an ugly thing. And we didn't think about it 10 years ago as much as we're thinking about it now that seeing the world from the animal's eye view and saying they are not ours to enslave like this. And smaller species like mice feel just as much as an elephant. And we don't, it's hard for us to imagine it like that. But if you see 30 mice in a lab, each one is an individual. And if you knew those little mice or rats, you would know this is Harvey and this is Prabhu and he has a whole different personality. And this is, you know, this is Manisha and she likes her carrots this way and she likes to clean her baby that way. They all have unique characters. And when we see them in a group, just like if we see a bunch of white Americans, we at first they all look alike. And then you realize, oh no, that's the old guy that's mean. That's the nice lady. And they all gradually don't look alike at all. And that's the same with every type of animal. So today, people like you and me are able to remember that and say, every bird we see on a branch, if we saw it and we knew that it was the same bird every day, we'd know that this one's different than that one and has its own purposes and its own funny little ways and its own charm. And and it's not here for me to trap and put in a box. And, you know, speaking of birds, anybody that you know that is keeping a parrot in a cage or any, any kind of a bird, you have given that parrot a life of hell. They have to be flying. They have to be flying. You might as well chain your grandmother to the, the red fuel, you know, cooking gas thing and leave her there as put a bird in a cage. So we can't do that anymore. And, and better that they 
if they are if their wings have been clipped, which is often the case, so that they cannot fly, let it out of the cage and let it walk around your house. Then don't keep it in the cage if it can't fly. If it's been maimed like that, mutilated, or if it's been injured by a kite string and can't fly, and you've been kind enough to take it in, in any case, don't leave it in. And if you have to clean up a little bit of bird poop, that's all right. You'll live. Let it make its own way around your house. And it'll be an extraordinary pet if you do that anyway. They're so, they're so involved with everything and with you. But so anyway, I'll just wrap up that question. People give me hope and, I, and they keep me strong. And what I know a lot of people that feel deeply about animals as I do, and maybe as you do too, Manasa, if we kind of hold hands psychologically and make contact with each other, even if we can't really in a practical way help in the situation that our, our friend or acquaintance is in, we often can't do anything but listen. But if, you're, if you know somebody who's grieving over a, an animal that died, listen, because it's just as big a grief as any. And we give each other so much support. And if, if your friends are scared of global, war, global warming, I think for young people, this is terrifying. I think being together in being, in a, being afraid of what it's doing to animals and the environment and to us as a species, our own species, it helps to cling to each other and say, what can we do? What can we do as small as it might seem Big things are made of a bunch of small things. We can change this world. We have to, we should believe it, it's true. And if we keep our energy up for it and say, don't, don't shake your head at the small things. Respect the small changes too, because they add up. And nothing big ever happened without being a bunch of little things. So just Keep doing what changes you can. If, if let's say at the start you said, I'm just gonna have one less cup of chai a day. After a year, you might've saved the life of five cows just by doing that, just one less cup of chai. Or you, you, know, you talked somebody else into also reducing their, their chai by that much, or to say, I'm not gonna buy leather shoes anymore. There's plenty of good faux leather, fake leather, non you know, cloth shoes. I'm just not going to do that anymore. We can bring down the consumer and that's demotivating to the business person who is using animals for profit. And it, we're, we don't need to spend a lot of time changing that business owner's mind. We can change the consumer's mind and it won't be good business for the, for the owner and they'll gradually go to some other, some other field. Yeah, have faith in the small things that you do. When you're going to the grocery store, bring your own bag. Don't use plastic anymore. And we, of course, we all, it's easy to say that, but if you can make it a habit, and I have a, I can improve a lot on that. I can't tell you, Manasa, the number of times that I go to the store and I'm kicking myself because I did forget the bag. Like, how could I forget it? I'm talking about it all the time and I did forget it. That happens, but just the next time, tie a finger, a string on your finger to remember, but you know, you can do it. And all those little things feel great to do. That, that I can agree with, like small things really do add up. And yeah, thank you for that. And so talking about snowball effect. So we seen uh, like recently in social media, we are hearing about adopt, don't shop. So does that actually implement, like, do you see any, like, adoptions, like, recently, more adoptions, have you seen it, have experienced? Yes, I have. Not in Udaipur, which is where Animal Aid is, not as, not as much as I, I wish, but I think we have some really good adoption specialist, active volunteers in uh, several places. Who are, who are young people who are very clever at finding ways to, for instance, get, get animals fostered. And fostering means a temporary home before you found an adoptive family to get it out of the shelter and help it be socialized. And that fostering link has been really fruitful for 
teaching people about what it is to have a pet in your house and making the animal healthier and more adoptable. So there are people that are doing it. And in urban centers, I think it is getting more popular. And I think activists are making the Deshi dog come into its own as a, res as a super respectable variety of dog that's the Deshi dogs. And this is true for, for all of them, but they're very adapted to this climate. They're very healthy. They're usually slim and trim. They're usually super loyal, very bright, um, resourceful. Like there's all the qualities of the of the Deshi dog. If you were if you were in you know California, people would pay big money for a Deshi dog nature because they're gentle. Actually, they're a very gentle breed. They're they're not. If you have a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler, they have been bred to be fighters. They've been bred to be aggressive. These pit bulls that are not popular in India yet, but they are used by very um, ignorant people in other countries to make them fight. And as a, it's like a betting gambling ring. People make in India. They'll they'll have. There are dog fights in India. And uh, I've heard that in Punjab, there's dog racing. There's cockfighting. There's these animals. These are brutal. They're not sports. They're they're cruelty entertainments. And um, you can imagine the people that are interested by that is is not a it's a very a very low low level of of entertainment. I can't think of anything lower. Um, but um, I can't, oh, those dogs have been bred to be uh, aggressive and fearful. And aggressive really means fearful. These these are dogs, when, when you have a German Shepherd barking, 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 and acting aggressive on a chain in somebody's house, it's because when a dog is chained all the time, and the Deshi dog might do the same, they don't have any way of getting away from you. So all they can do to protect themselves mentally is be, say, is to tell you, stay away from me. It's fear. It's not hostility, it's fear, really, it's at the bottom of it, because we've taken away all their choices. And that's been bred into some of these other aggressive breeds. Anyway, Deshi dogs are, who have been on the street, very well balanced, emotionally, usually super healthy emotionally. And that's why, like in animal aid, we experience bringing new dogs into populations of dogs who have been in treatment for several weeks. You would think there'd be big fights, and there, there occasionally there's a fight, but what's amazing is how these dogs are so diplomatic that they, 99% of the time, you know, we let them rest for a day or two in a kennel so that they're not just thrown into a, a big group. But after they've kind of sized up the place, they've smelled the smells, they're full, they've rested, they've got their balance, now they're in a, they're in a hospital, not on the street, and they usually get along with each other. And it's just incredible to see this um, peaceful disposition emerge in populations where I would have thought before we were doing this that it would be really dangerous. And it's so dumb how in, in America, the shelters, it's so tragic and dumb. Most of them isolate the dogs are alone and they're not let to socialize because they're afraid they're gonna fight. And I just feel like if they would, just relax and let the dogs go out into the group, they would see that, okay, there might be a like fight or two, but the balance of their, the benefit to them of being together so outweighs the risk. It's just, you know, it's just dumb the way they do that. Do you have any plans to like uh, expand apart from Uday? Do you have any plans? Yes, but it's not expansion in the way you might be thinking, Manasa. Um, sometimes people ask us, so are you gonna open in Bangalore? Or you, can you open in you know, Karnataka? And no, we are not planning on expanding in that way. But the way we want to expand is to increase our training opportunities so that people like you, Manasa, and friends of yours and people everywhere have a chance to come and learn basic behavioral conditions, basic first aid. If they wanna to go to another level of knowledge, they will be able to graduate into another deeper level of medical knowledge. 
but so that we can develop using animal aid as a model to teach protocols for how to humanely catch, how to tag a dog so you know where it has to go back, how to get animals sterilized, how to help animals that have been hurt on the street, how to teach other people about animal behavior and be a community resource for them, understand more about what rabies is and how to protect other people from it and how to identify dangerous dogs, dangerous to themselves, I mean, dogs are trouble, how to treat mange, just common things that will kill dogs, but easy to treat. All those things, we wanna develop Animal Aid as a training center so that people like you can go back to your home in Pune or back to wherever you're, you're from and gradually, maybe you and your friends, volunteer at shelters near to you, come back to Animal Aid, get experience and start to do your own active protection right in your own neighborhoods and develop a little group of, of volunteers is you can save incredible, we, there are many such little groups of, of five and 10 people in Calcutta, all, I mean, all over the country that if many of them don't have the skills they need. And so we wanna provide that, but also we can help you learn how to fundraise and you know get money because all the medicine costs. And, and in that way, it's not that we wanna expand animal aid per se, but we wanna grow this animal protection movement by increasing the capacity of normal, ordinary people like you who may not want it to be your life's work. Maybe you're not saying, oh, I want to, I want to develop a whole shelter, but I, do, but I do want to make a contribution and I want to be a, a resource when an animal's in trouble. I want to be one of the people that can jump in and help. And, and you have to learn some skills to do it, but it's super fun to learn the skills. And then you can volunteer also at, at shelters all over the country. I mean, I think one of the greatest vacations I can imagine doing if I was 25 years old would be to have a group of three friends and say, okay, let's go to animal aid from Udaipur. Let's go up to Jaipur and go to help and suffering from Jaipur. Let's go and spend three days at all creatures, great and small in Delhi. And then let's go, you know, to say we've got three weeks. Let's just do a four stop animal volunteering thing. And we'll learn so much about, aha, this shelter does it this way. That shelter, I didn't like the way they did this, but I like the way they do that and I can help here. That's a super fun service to do. And to remember all those ways of serving the, the organizations and the animals that are in them is really preparing you for independence, to be independently resourceful for the animals in your world. And you can grow that and make it bigger. You can, you can keep it small and say, look, there's three mama dogs that I want to get spayed and I'm going to take good care of them for the next four years. It doesn't have to be at a huge scale, but at whatever scale, there's learning ahead. And, and the learning is fascinating and fun. And it, it's an unending um, arc of learning because the more the more you know the more you get for most of the people I know like the more interested you get in animals and it's it's just like a the hot if it's a hobby I don't even know if I like that word but it grows and my dad always said if you have an interest in life you'll always be okay the people, that, the people that suffer are the people that don't have an interest to pursue. And they're, they're the people that get bored and they get, oh, I'm fat and ugly. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a good athlete. I'm not, a, I'm not very smart. All that self, all that self blame of, of stuff that comes from having an idle mind. You know, in America, anorexia where girls stop eating and they get super obsessed with their appearance. Even I suffered from that when I was in my 20s. And it, it comes from, I think it comes from, from like you're just turning into your, against yourself out of, because you're not stimulated enough by your own interests. And animals pull you out of yourself, no matter what depression you are in, no matter how low you feel or sad you might feel about something else, love problem, money problem, anything. A relationship with an animal on the spot in that moment right now 
fixes you, as long as you're focused on him or her, your load will lighten automatically every time. And I can just, it's one of those things where I don't need to second guess and say, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that because maybe it's not true every time. No, it is true every single time. Like it's a miracle. It's true. It's like love. You never go wrong when you love. If you love, if you're worried about, am I loved back? Then you might get into trouble. But if you're about love, the more you spend, the more is in your pocket to spend. It's a crazy miracle like that. And, and that's how it is with animal love too. I have a friend who lives alone. She's in her thirties and she's probably, she's divorced and she's probably not going to get married. And I, I said, do you ever get lonely? Cause she lives in a house and in, in the, in the suburb. And she said, no, she's an animal person, but she said, I'm never alone. I've got the birds. I've got the insects. I've got my dogs. I never feel alone. I've got the trees. And I just, that oh makes me cry even now. That was such a beautiful thing to say. I'm, I'm not alone. I've got the trees. Like that is beautiful. What a thing to think, you know? So I'll, I never will forget that. That's actually a, a different perspective to think like, you know. It's yeah, it was for me too. Uh, it changed me a little bit. It, 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 it was, and it, I only heard it a few years ago and I've thought about it a hundred, a thousand times since she said that. So the last question was like, uh, in your website, I saw Memorialize Your Pet, which I thought was very unique because it was like, you know, so just a pet, you don't treat it as a pet. You think of it much more. Instead of just for yourself, you are showing it to others. So how did you come up with that idea? So that's what I wanted to ask. I don't know if it's if you realize this, Manasa, but the memorializing page is for people whose pets have died. Did you know that? It's for okay. Um, I, it's not a unique idea. I think other other shelters. I'm not sure in India if they do it, but in other uh, websites I had seen it. So I didn't invent it. I copied it. But why? The reason that I copied it was that I was so emotionally comforted and kind of both made me cry and comforted me to read the and it still does with animal aids memorials page to know that other people have loved animals like i have and the animals have died and when you lose i don't know if manasa have you ever had a pet or lost a had a pet die no no it's okay oh, well it's your bonding with them is is sort of like it's in a Every, every relationship with everybody is unique, but it's, it's super painful. Like it's just, if you think, oh, it's, if somebody ever thinks it's just a dog, it's just a bird, they never probably had one before that was close to their heart because one, it's, it's, um, it rocks your world and you never forget them and you think about them all the time and it's just, it's not, to my mind, I've lost parent, both my parents, I've lost my only sibling, just last year, I've lost some love, very close friends. And I would not say that I miss and, and love them in some hugely different way than I miss and love Tarzan or, or you know, Hero or uh, Kelly, you know, the uh, do dogs that have been really, really close to me. I, uh, Charlie, my cat, I love him so much. And he died a couple of years ago. And I every time I go to the garden, I say, where are you, Charlie? Are you here, Charlie? And I, I, you know, I'm sad about it still, but I, I, but I think those memorials give us a little bit of sense of like, oh, we're all in it together in this, this loss. Cause I think also without a one more happy aspect of that is that if you lost a pet, there's a lot of people that never have had pets and didn't lose or have never loved an animal and they don't know what you're experiencing and they don't know how bad it is. And so they minimize it. They don't realize that you're really grieving and that you actually need 12 days of grief and you need to have a blanket put over your head. That, that probably if it was a, if this world were fair, we would not go to work for like two weeks after we lost a pet. We're not, we're not ready, you know, and but, uh, but the society expects us to just not miss a beat and that as if it's a very minor thing. But for many of us, it's traumatic 
And so when you see other people's memorials, you're in the, you're like, you're in the same family of, of the of attitude about about what has happened to you and, and to them. So that's sweet that you focused on that. And I just want to thank you and thank all your listeners. And I also, before we get off, I want to say that in the description for the video, I'd love to put my own email address or the at, at Animal Aid with a deep promise that anybody that writes me with a question, if it's a veterinary medical question, I can't answer it because I don't know, we don't have online vet medical service. But if it's a question about, you know, how can I get started or what can I do in this situation? My neighbors, my neighbors um, criticizing me for feeding the dogs uh, and he's threatening to, you know, remove the dog. I can help you in some very practical ways like that. And if you are emotional about something, my mother won't let me have my, she's making me, I don't know, I can, I just will write back. I love to write and I love to have new relationships with people that are putting their toe in the water of animal love, or maybe they really already are into it and, and they, they need some advice or they need a laugh or whatever. It, it, my pleasure to have contact. And let's put the link for this Federation of Indian Animal Protection so that in case you're listening and you're somewhere, maybe they can find somebody to help you in an emergency. They have this emergency hotline thing. So that's a really cool thing. And if, you've li if you live near shelters or any rescue center, please volunteer or ask them if you can volunteer. And please come to Animal Aid in Udaipur. You, because of COVID, we need to be more, uh, make an appointment to do it, but we're sl slowly starting to open back up our volunteer program. And we love, love visitors and volunteers. You don't have to make a big life commitment. You can come for a day when our volunteer program is really up and running and it is so much fun. And there's the hotels around Animal Aid are cheap. We don't have a hostel or anything, but, but the hotels you can get for a few hundred rupees a night, a decent place. So that, and it's really, really fun to do it. So I hope I can welcome you and I hope, Manasa, I hope I can meet you in person. Yeah, yes, ma'am, for sure. Like you have like piqued my interest. So I'll, for sure, I'll come to the pool and visit you and the animals. So, yeah, great, great. Just, so with that, I'll conclude the interview. So it was really great talking to you. So you have inspired me and I'm sure it has inspired our audiences as well. So I wish you all the very best and may you achieve all your goals, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, that's so lovely. And you have inspired me too in your your beautiful open face of and your interest and your enthusiasm touches my heart genuine, genuinely. Nice to love lovely to meet you. You too, man. Bye for Bye, have a good day. If anyone has any doubts, they can email it to Erica Ma'am at Erica Abrams at animalaidunlimited.org. If you see an animal suffering from an accident or an illness and need to find help, if there is a group in your area, call them. If you don't know who to call and cannot find anything when you try to google it, then write to emergencydesk at fiapo.org. That's from the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organization and they have a roster of people who may be able to help with an animal emergency in your area. If you want to know more about or if you want to connect with Animal Aid Unlimited organization, you can visit their website and social media page and to explore their work regularly, you can visit their commander page. Links to the website and social media page and commander page is given below in the video description. Thank you.